now attempting encrypted transmission. Hello, agents. If you are receiving this transition, this means you are tuning in to a brand new episode of the Channel Chasers podcast. Welcome. As always, I am Jay, the King of Hearts. Joining me, as always, is Brian, the King of Clubs, and Tony, the King of Diamonds. Now, yeah. So, how are you gentlemen doing this fine nice. evening? Good. Da, 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 da. I'm excited. Sorry, wrong franchise. I'm excited to talk about this. Uh, so, Oh yeah, indeed. Movie Night continues for us here at the Channel Tasters podcast. Uh, I hope you guys are enjoying the They Cloned Tyrone episode. It was a really fun, in-depth discussion. Uh, we, we had, we had a, a really interesting conversation back and forth. I definitely think, you know, that episode is worth checking out. Uh, but uh, thank you to everybody who checked it out already, uh, you know, as this, go as this video goes yeah. up. Uh, but... The uh, movie that we're talking about this week, as Brian alluded to earlier, stars a uh, wonderful star, Miss Gal Gadot. Uh, it is a another Netflix original action movie. This one is called Heart of Stone. And fun fact about this movie that blew my mind, because uh, mm -hmm. like, and and it's actually connected to uh, you know what I'm talking about with uh, screen time. But I was doing research on the movie after I had finished it because I was like you know inputting the tags and stuff for the video, and it turns out that this screenplay for this movie was written by none other than Greg Rucka himself. Now, if the name Greg Rucka does not sound familiar to you, you're not a comic book fan because Greg Rucka is one of, he's a uh, former crime novelist and mm -hmm. he is one of the greatest uh, living comic book ar uh, writers of all time, in my opinion. He has one of the most legendary runs on Captain America. He created a, uh, a little, a tiny obscure character by the the code name of the uh, Winter Soldier, yeah, that guy. You know, one of the most uh, simple characters in the MCU, at least from the female. And I mean, like, audience. If you if you want high octane thriller espionage, you read his Captain America run, his Secret Avengers, his independent series Velvet. You watch this fucking movie. It like. As I was watching it, before I even knew it was him who wrote it, I was like, this feels like a Greg Rucka book. And I was like, wait oh, a minute, yeah. this is a Greg Rucka script. What the fuck? It's crazy. Oddly enough, felt more like a Black Widow movie than the actual Black Widow movie. Yep. <laughs> and uh, like yeah. an, an, another, another fun fact. Uh, so uh, one of the other characters that Rucka is famous for in terms of like his uh, legendary runs, he has uh, two runs on Wonder Woman. And uh, so like, it's just really funny that like the, you know, a movie with a screenplay that he wrote stars the actress, um, you know, most famous for playing the uh, first big screen adaptation of Wonder Woman. And in obscure Wonder Woman, like lore and trivia, back in the 70s, they actually depowered Wonder Woman and turned her into a kung fu action super spy. Uh, th this, uh, this is mm -hmm. the era most people know as mod Wonder Woman. And this got all the, uh, all the, you know, classic modern feminists pissed because they were like dude we had this amazing strong powerful icon and you just fucking took all her cool shit away what the fuck is wrong with you uh but yeah no it, it, it's just super cool it's just a weird little bit of connection that like uh just kind of a six degrees of separation kind of thing that like we actually do get to see a spy thriller with a wonder woman in it you know in a way so it was a lot. Yeah. Of, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, we'll get into deeper, like, conversation about it. I'm a big fan of uh, spy movies. You know, I love the Bond films. I love. I love the Man from Uncle TV show. '60s spy shit is kind of my thing. I was just gonna say, ever since uh, Craig uh, stepped away, there really hadn't been uh, too many. Uh spy stuff lately and there's been like and a huge gap since like it's been a while since the you know the kingsman prequel came out which is fucking awesome by the way you guys definitely watch the kingsman yeah prequel. yes it is also um an older thing 
which is still awesome, which y'all should check out. The movie, not so much, but definitely the TV show. The Avengers. And I'm not talking about the Marvel Avengers. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, another another good uh, spy movie that I enjoyed that actually does star Scarlett Johansson and proved that she could have done a really good Black Widow movie if given a good premise, Atomic Blonde. Atomic Blonde was fun. That was not Scarlett. That wasn't Scarlett Johansson? Who was, who was, in, who was in Atomic Charlize. Blonde? Charlize. Oh, that was Charlize Theron. Oh, my bad. Still, dope yeah. movie. Dope movie. Yes, hey, yes, it was. Greg Rucka. Here's an interesting fact I think I may not have told these gentlemen. Okay. You got to meet him once. Oh, nice. It was a few years ago at one of my first comic conventions I ever went to. Uh, oh, it was a great time. I got to pick his brain a little. Cool. Was he nice? Was he nice? Yes, he was, actually. Cool. Give me a lot of uh, fun insights. I mean, it's years of separation, but I do recall meeting him. Nice. All those years. That's awesome. Yeah, nice. like, like I said, he's one of my he's one of awesome. my favorite comic writers, like just of all time. For real. Fun fact. Mm-hmm. Rudka did not have a hand in Atomic Blonde, but he did have an, a hand in another Charlize. Uh, movie. What, Mad Max Fury Road? The Old Guard. Oh, I love The Old Guard! That movie's fucking sick! Yep, and he's, uh, I believe his next thing that he's doing is the sequel. Oh, Ooh. nice. Nice. But yeah, well, we're definitely but excited to talk it about back, it. Mm-hmm. This definitely deserves a sequel, too. Oh, yeah. We're definitely excited to talk about it. And we'll actually have speculations and stuff when we go into more detail. Um, it's it's a spy thriller that's globetrotting. It spans multiple agencies, multiple countries, action-packed, very well-choreographed action. A couple well surprise shot. actors. Mm-hmm. Very well shot. The cinematography is amazing. Definitely recommend it. It's on Netflix. Go check it out. Uh, but that's pretty much yeah. it for our spoiler-free discussion of the movie. I know that's super quick, but really we can't really say much about it without going into super detail. So before we get to that, we're going to go ahead and jump right into the news with Brian. Okay, people, so we've got um, sandwiching uh, two smaller stories, uh, one big story in between two smaller stories, but uh, un- and none of them have to do with the strike, which, uh, like I said, each week, if we don't talk about the strike as a news story, just want to re-up our support. Yep. Let y'all know that we're totally for it and that they should pay the writers and actors. For sure. Yep. But uh, speaking about actors, uh, gentlemen, I hate to say it, but we lost another one. Oh, not another one. Okay. Who is it now? Uh, you won't recognize the name at first, but you'll recognize like his most infamous role. Okay. Uh, Johnny Hardwick. Nope, don't recognize the name. What's his most infamous role? Dale Gribble. Oh, no! no! I, do. I do know him, because I've... a weird fact. I've actually seen a few King of the Hill reviews, and I actually heard of this news before... Oh and I was like, no! Yeah. Mm-hmm. I did, did. Was he able to record uh, for the for the revive? Okay, good. Yes, thank God. I had to remember that we're doing an audio, so I actually had to say yes. Okay, cool, thank- cool. Whew. Thank God, man. Rest in peace, you paranoid bastard. Not the not the yep. a- not the actor, of course. I have no I have no idea about the gentleman. I was more referring to the character. Uh, yeah. Um, Pakete. He he was a stand up comedian at first. Mm-hmm. And uh I didn't know this, but uh 
he was initially just brought on to uh, write for it. Huh. Interesting. And uh, their initial uh, person who was going to voice Dale fell through. So they were like, hey. Hmm. And then the rest is history. Yeah. No, yeah. Uh, rest in peace. I'm going to. Indeed. And- the revival gets any more seasons there's no way on this green earth that they're ever going to replace that man we'll see uh, we'll see but also i just want to point out here another thing i hate to go back to it but we do have to address it especially if there are people uh dealing with this at home but uh okay his uh his uh cause of death is self termination public it's not publicly known at this point what his cause of death was but police found him after doing a welfare check ah so oh, it you, might you, have you, been you mean you mean a wellness check wellness yeah sorry yeah. it's okay um but yeah wow uh sad news if true um either way rest in peace Indeed, and anyone out there who's dealing with those kind of thoughts, reach out to somebody. Doesn't have to be a professional. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, it, it's always it's always you know best to just get help and support when you need it. Uh, mm-hmm. So, what's our next story? All right. So, next story. Uh, we are going from uh, talk about a new show that was announced at HBO. Mm. You mean Max? Uh, don't know if it's going to be on Max or not. Wait, HBO and Max are separate again? Well, there are still some shows that will come out first on HBO and then oh, teleport to Max. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Like, I believe that's how House of the Dragon is. Hmm. God. But this one, this one sounds interesting. Okay. It's a completely new idea. Okay. Nani? It's called it's called The Franchise. Okay. It is a scripted show about the making of a superhero movie. Oh, that's interesting. And it's being done by the Veep creator. Oh, so it's going to be funny and uh, uh, JLD is probably going to be in it. Yeah. Uh, so if, far if she, for the if cast. She's not busy with uh what what is her Contessa? That's her character's name, JLD. Hmm. Right? What the what the fuck is uh you know uh Oh. Oh. That uh Valentina. Valentina, there you go. I was yeah, like Contessa. Yeah. I was Valentina. Like, I was like, I was, is it like it's something uh, I, and I I just don't feel like saying Julie uh Julie Louise Dreyfus, so I just No. You know. I get you. But uh it looks like they're going for relative unknowns for this. Interesting. Um, some of the more popular people, notable, is uh, if you all remember that show uh, Maniac with uh, Jonah Hill and Emma Stone. Yeah. Uh, no. I saw it. Uh, we we covered it in a different format. We did for this show. That was it. Was super. Tri- I, it was super trippy. It was. Well, the dude who played Jonah Hill's brother is in this. Oh, okay. Uh, the uh, the female lead from uh, uh, Simon Pegg's Big Break, uh, Spaced, she's yeah. going to be in it. Cool. And the biggest name is actually another, uh, a former superhero herself. Okay. Stormfront. Huh. <laughs> So, the actors oh, who played God. Stormfront, nice. Yeah. Uh, and last story is, like I said, a smaller story, but I feel like, especially in these times of uh, the strike that we got of, give credit to do to like the actual good people, like A24. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because um, their current movie right now, Talk to Me, is 
doing really well in the box office. I've I think heard they really said good things about it. Oh yeah, one of their most successful films of all time. I'm hearing people say that's the best horror film of the year, and uh, apparently it's done so well that they've already greenlit a sequel. Oh nice. yes. I, yeah, it, I, I'm trying to. I, I'm trying to see this as soon as I can because it, it looks great. And, uh, you know what the sequel is called? What is it? Talk to me. Ah, uh, nice. Nice. I like it. Classic. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Uh, and, uh, what you call it? Trying to do a prequel film too. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah, that's what uh, I. I mean horror circles and all and i would nice take a new horror franchise that does something different in terms of horror than like jump scares yeah no it, it's again we're going Which... back to we're going back it goes back to like the whole psychological thing to cycle back to the we clone tyrone episode uh, they clone tyrone episode from last week uh it seems mm-hmm. to be i mean i haven't seen the movie itself but from what i've heard from people who have seen it it's very much a like psychological horror about grief and dealing with grief mm-hmm. which is so weird because we actually i believe we covered the trailer for it mm-hmm. and it looked like it had the potential to be another one of these generic yeah, it, horror it, films yeah, that I, usually I, I, stars I, lucy hale yeah i remember we made that joke that it felt like uh ready or not yeah yeah and it turned out this was actually like good <laughs> see this just shows like you can have really bad trailers but be a really good movie Although we should have known because A twenty four A A twenty four is also the ones that do the uh, the Pearl yeah, trilogy yeah yeah X and all that yep mm-hmm. Damn Which, it, uh, fuck you Seto you can see me on you, camera brother. I'm flipping you off right now Seto fuck you and, uh, I wish you could find like a a chibi umu just giving the bird twice over. Oh man, Seto. Why why did you not warn us that that was going to happen in that movie? Audio only listeners and YouTube people, you're going to have no context for this, but Seto, if you're watching this, you know and fuck you. You evil bastard. All right. But well, I heard good things about Pearl. Yeah, same. Her great. Same. Yeah, and uh and uh XXX Maxine, I believe that's the name of the next one. Yep. Or Maxine with three X's. Yeah, it's Maxine with three X's. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's that's exciting. Again, the, uh, it's one that I'm definitely gonna try and ch- uh, check out. Uh, if not, I might just save it for October because it'll probably it'll probably be on VOD by then for sure. So I don't know. I might I might check it out around that time. So is that it for the news? Uh, yes. All right. So transitioning over, we are going to do a uh, segment we haven't done in a bit, but we do have comments. So we're going to go ahead and transfer over to Comment Corner. All right. Uh, Brian, I am unable to pull up the screen right now. Can you tell me what the comment is? And I will uh, respond. I know it is on my uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, solo review. So, from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles solo review, Zach Mean Talks Movies. I believe that's how you say yep, that. Yep, Zach Mean Talks Movies, yep said the versions of the turtles in this movie were different from the ones I grew up with especially having them attend high school but the core of the characters and what made them iconic was still there even Superfly was pretty good villain overall was pretty enduring and fun so i had a good time with it great review well thank you zach and yeah thank you to everybody who checked out my uh tmnt mutant mayhem review uh 
like i had a blast with that movie uh, it was the whole reason i told the guys that like you know i want to bring solo reviews back for all of us which by the way i'm not the only one who did a solo review brian also did a full explanation on twisted metal uh season one uh so you guys you know don't have to just uh you know listen to his uh partial explanation in his screen time from uh last week's episode of the podcast still a little rusty at solo reviews but i did it and yeah. uh thank you to those who have watched it but yeah no uh turtles was fun uh i didn't really get to say this uh in my uh solo review so i'll i will mention this i love the portrayal of the turtles in terms of like them actually being kids um the fact that they got you know real teenage voice actors to play the turtles was such a nice touch uh from what i found out um after doing the review i did research and it turns out that they actually recorded in a room together uh when they uh, did the uh, the readings for the dialogue, nice. and a lot of their banter was actually improvised and rewritten to match the actual flow of their regular ass jokes. So that's why they that's feel good. so naturally like brothers. And this this makes me really excited for the upcoming uh, Paramount TV series that is gonna that is going to star these same uh, actors as the turtles. Obviously, Jackie Chan's too expensive and Paul Rudd's too expensive, but they're coming back as the Turtles and April's coming back. That's the important part. Uh, really excited. Nice. I love this movie. Highly recommend it. Uh, go check out my review for further details to see what I thought about it. But uh, thank you again, Zach, for the comment. Thanks. All right. So is... By that... the way, uh -huh. we lost Tony. Did we? I still see him no. here. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say. I'm here. Yeah. Oh, shoot. My thing is weird. Uh, I was like, no, Tony's still here. Um, yeah. any... it, it only showed you and me. Oh, that was just pro that's just probably the display you have it in. Yeah, uh, it was. Uh, but... uh, I fumbled when uh, I uh, had to pull up the thing real quick. Oh, that's all My good. Bad. So uh, is, that, is that it for comments? Yep. All right. So... Jumping straight from comment corner, it looks like it's that time again. It is screen time. Screen time, for those of you who are new to the podcast, is the segment of the podcast where we all go over the different bits of media we have been consuming in between podcast episodes. This time, we will start with Tony. Tony, what have you been consuming in between podcast episodes? Well, dealing with uh, real life stuff. I have not been really watching much, but I was able to watch at least partway through the first season of Batman, The Brave and the Bold. Ah, classic. Love that show. Nice. Still one of my favorite shows. I got to the end of... I didn't even get to the episode with Music Meister yet, which oh, makes me big sad. That's my favorite episode of the series. Man. The last episode that I recall watching off the top of my head was when we meet the Outsiders. Oh, cool. But I gotta say, I kind of dig some of the designs for the characters. And look, I get it. You put Katana in a schoolgirl uniform. Funny, but a more comic accurate costume would have been most appreciated. Thank you, show. I mean, it, it was a nice little anime reference. I dug it. Nice anime reference, but it, it would have been a little bit better if, uh, I, I mean, I get it. They're just regular ass kids that get trained up by Wildcat. Perfectly cast by way for Wildcat. Oh, yeah. I, I think, he, yeah. I, well, I don't ever, I don't ever remember that actor's name. He, I just know him as the mail call guy. Fuck, um, fuck is that guy's name? Arlie Ernie? There you go. Yeah. yeah. All I know is Mr. Drill Sergeant. Yeah, he's the ma he's the mail call guy. If y'all remember mail call from the, the History Channel. Uh, All I know is I know him as just Mr. Drill Sergeant. And that's about it. Yep. You know, he, cast yeah, Wildcat. great casting, great casting. So and that, uh. You know, mm -hmm. Preparing for other things down the pipeline because, as of this recording, we are two days away from my actual birthday. Nice! Happy early birthday. Wish Tony a happy birthday in the comments, you two people. Happy early birthday, Tony. Thank you, lads. 
Yeah, I wish I could do more, but that's pretty much it for me. All right, Brian, what have you been consuming in between podcast episodes? Well, for me, I mostly... Well, part of it is uh, research for um, a game that we're doing, a TTRPG that we're doing in the mm-hmm. future. Mm-hmm. And then part of it was just online TTRPG stuff. But anyway, uh, I watched, I finally watched that movie, uh, mm-hmm. Jiu Jitsu. Mm-hmm. The one with, uh, Frank Grillo and uh, Nicolas Cage. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's on Netflix, and, right? Yeah. Yep. It was pretty good. Uh, the plot is uh, a little wonky. Listen, man. And nothing can get more wonky in a Nicholas. Uh, in terms of Nicolas Cage action movie plots than Con Air. If you just read the script for Con Air straight and look at that plot, that is insane. Well, do you know what the plot of this movie is? No. Every six years, an alien comes to Earth to have a good fight with the locals and imbues them with this mysterious force called jujitsu. Okay. So they have a fighting chance. Okay, this sounds and, uh, this sounds like your standard like out there martial arts action movie. Okay. And uh, this year something goes awry, and uh, the main guy that's supposed to fight him now has amnesia and is caught by the local military. Hmm. And stuff ensues and uh it's not the best of movies but the action is really good and uh i forgot her name now but the main female fighter is great uh i i heard that uh she's been nicknamed the uh the next bruce lee oh cool that's a, and that's a pretty tall comparison She's the one that, like, inspired me to do, like, the nunchucks for our personal project thing. Oh, cool. And, and uh, the other big criticism is Nicolas Cage isn't in it enough. Oh, damn, that's always a shame. But, hey, Nicolas Cage, uh, minor spoiler alert, does get a one-on-one fight with the alien. Here's my one question, though, Brian. Is he uncaged? Is the question? Uh, not as much. Uh-huh. Not as like full, full Nick Cage. So, so, so like, what's the like, what's the percentage? What's the percentage? Somewhere between seventy to eighty. Okay, I'm down with that. Right. I'm down with that. That's well, acceptable. Yeah, that is a acceptable margin for cageness. Because uh. Again, uh, minor spoiler, he he plays someone who was supposed to fight it six years ago, but ran. Mm-hmm. And now it's kind of looking for redemption. Yeah, okay, cool. But uh, I watched that one. Then I watched uh, Keanu movie, um, finally. Oh, the... I had never seen it. Oh, you're talking about the, the one with uh, Key and Peel with the cat? No, uh, 47 Ronin. Oh, I thought you were talking about the movie Keanu, where it was like the John Wick parody no. with the cat. Oh, never mind. No, I hadn't seen that one yet, but I did see uh, 47 Ronin, oh, cool. which was good. It was good, and the atmosphere and the actors did a good job. The story was a little paint by numbers, but... I mean, it's an Overall, old story from Japan. <laughs> yeah, it's it's from the like, what was it, two thousand seventeen? No, but like the like the story it comes from is ah, oh, it's yeah. it's an old old ass kabuki play from Japan. Yep, I hear you. It's one. Of I get older. I get what you're saying. Yeah, it's one of the oldest 
kabuki theater plays ever to be performed in japan mm-hmm. yep it's the, the other it, one is, the, is uh, uh the one that inspired uh seven samurai yeah and the other one the other kabuki play was an on rio story i think it is the i, I know the ghost is owiwa and it had to deal with her being thrown in a well not the well. Oh, because I I know that one. Because uh, oh, because because that, that one is the one that also inspired, like eventually inspired uh, the Grudge. Because uh, it focused on a samurai, a Ronin's wife, that got disfigured by said Ronin, in order to marry a much younger woman. Oh, I feel like hmm. I've heard. Yeah, no, I feel like I've heard of this one. Yeah, but uh. I also, <laughs> I also had plans to watch the sequel, but I didn't get around to it. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, because uh, I don't know if you know it, but uh, last year they released a sequel to it hmm. that uh, takes place in modern day called uh, Blades of the 47 Ronin. Huh? And uh, it stars uh, YouTube's own Anna Kana. What? Weird. Yep. Huh. And uh, has a Mark uh, Dukakis or whatever his name yeah, is, yeah, the yeah. chairman from uh... from Iron Chef. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, to things that I actually did watch, uh, I watched the uh, the um, last chapter of uh, the last episode of uh, chapter one of uh, Candela Obscura, which is the that Critical Role spinoff thing where uh, they're doing more of a horror, steampunk, Lovecraftian-esque s- story. And what? it was... I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's got... Um, there were only four players. Uh, it was uh, The Last of Us Girls, the ones that played Ellie and Abby. Mm. Oh, okay. And then uh, two of their like friends of the show that did uh, that little side quest called uh, Exandria Unlimited. Mm. Okay. Uh, but uh, I watched that, and it was really good. And it was really it got really intense at parts because it's not really a combat based uh, thing. Mm-hmm. So when combat starts to happen, things get intense. Nice. Basically, uh, they have to fend off and fight a uh, monster that, like, steals your face. Oh, well, face off. Combat is as intense, if not even more intense. Mm-hmm. It's Jesus. But, uh, but, yeah, I also started watching um, the um, Board AF uh Betrayal Legacy, which uh, is a series on a uh, on a Smosh's uh, Smosh Games channel. Oh, uh, they they play um, Legacy. Uh, what what is it called? It's called like Betrayal on the the House on the Hill. Never heard it. it. It's a uh, it's an infamous board game where. Uh, you explore this haunted house, and then halfway through, one of the people, one of the people, like turns and becomes the bad guy. And there's like one of like fifty different ways that they can be the bad guy, hmm. and you have to play it out. And it's board game. But the way that they played it is, uh, since they're improv people, they were actually playing characters yeah. while doing it, and. Uh, they also were playing a uh, variation of the rules called the Legacy, which is uh, which is once you're done with the story, you then come back like 25 years later as the next generation of the people who didn't survive. Oh, so it's like a new game plus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, basic, basically, and. Uh, they did that for, I think it was like seven episodes, and I've watched like half of it. But it went over well so well, and they had so much fun with it that uh, 
after doing this, that same people decided that they were going to uh, do their own uh, D&D campaign. That's called Sword AF, and I have yet to check it out. But I wanted to check this out first, since it was kind of like the unofficial preamble. Mm -hmm. Which uh, the GM for their... uh, By the way, fun fact, the GM uh, plays the male lead in... uh, my Happy Marriage. Oh, cool. Uh, Damien Haas. Nice. Nice. But that's what I watch. All right. So with me, uh, since Brian ended off with YouTube, I'll start with YouTube. I, I discovered a new YouTube channel that brought me down a very interesting uh, rabbit hole. Uh, this YouTube channel is a uh, shout out to uh, them. Uh, the YouTube channel is called Digging the Greats. It is a YouTube channel basically where this uh, bass player slash DJ like talks about different samples uh, that are like featured prominently all throughout hip hop. And not only does he like break down the history of the sample, where it came from, he uh, recreates the beat, talks about, you know, the lyrics of certain songs, and he creates fun mashups. It's a, it's a really cool channel. Um, if you love music and you love uh, hip hop and production, it's definitely a, just a, a really, really fun watch. Great content. Uh, as somebody who, you know, dabbled in production and, and loves like music and audio engineering it's really really fucking cool and just to hear all the like the stories behind these different samples because like the reason i love hip-hop so much is because uh the way i've always seen it is hip-hop is storytelling in its purest form and it is uh the metaphor i like to use it's music built on the shoulders of giants because the thing with hip-hop is a lot of its music and uh, its production is built off of samples. You know, you take pieces of old, forgotten, obscure songs, put them together and make something completely brand new. And it's just to hear the journey of certain samples and like, wait, I've heard this. I've heard this drum loop before. I recognize this bass line. Oh, that's from that. That's really cool. So yeah, that, that channel is just really dope. I like literally spent like eight hours or something like that just listening to it in the background uh while working on other stuff just going through pretty much uh the dude's entire catalog uh great shit uh love that channel uh definitely subscribe to him good work uh other stuff in terms of tv shows i uh, checked out the first season of the bear on hulu which is a drama starring the actor who played uh lip on shameless basically it's this uh, about this young dude who wants to start a restaurant in chicago and uh just kind of the hardships of running a restaurant and uh you know some family drama and things like that really well done really well acted uh i have not gotten to season two yet but i've heard nothing but good things about season two um i'm looking forward yeah. to yeah i've heard great things i know that in season two um Bob Odenkirk is in it. Oh, nice. Good, uh, good I think Paul Rudd makes a cameo. Oh, sweet. Also, Wait. I don't know if she's in season one, but Jamie Lee Curtis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, I really enjoyed season one of The Bear. Uh, it, it's a really good show. Uh, we might cover it somewhere down the line if we have like space in the schedule. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, nice. Another show that I just kind of watched for fun because I heard about it. And, uh, like, we're definitely not going to cover it on the podcast because, like, it just it would get instantly demonetized. Um, it's a, oh, God. It's a, uh, it's a Netflix, uh, it's a Netflix scripted series uh, called Sex Life. And it's sex uh. slash life, but it's read as sex life. And, uh... Yep, I've it, seen clips. It's basically the TV equivalent of a trashy Harlequin novel. Like, there's a lot of fucking. It's n- and there isn't much story here, but there's a lot of fucking. Uh, basically, right to to give you guys like the the skinny. Uh, this this woman, 
this very attractive woman she's like she's a housewife she's married to this like very rich successful handsome dude has a nice family Every, everything's going good but then she comes across uh, she meets an old flame of hers that she fell in love with in Colombia, where they had just crazy, wild, passionate sex, and like it just, you know, she she uh, that spark isn't in her marriage anymore. She starts to have an affair, and it, it's just a lot of fucking, whole lot of fuck. <laughs> that's really all you got to say about it. Uh, like that's why that's one of the other reasons why we wouldn't do it on the podcast because literally that would be all we would have to say. It's just a lot of fucking. But just you know, people going to town. But you know, if you're if, if you're down oh. if you're down for a little trash and you just want to have fun, it's a it's a good one to just turn on. Pun intended. Hmm. Is that the one with uh, Sarah uh, Sahi? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, it, it's it's fun. Like like I said, it's it's. The TV equivalent of a trash Harlequin novel. Uh, look, sometimes sometimes you just want to watch trash. Okay, it doesn't, nothing wrong with that, uh, and that's what I did. Uh, the other thing, uh, I checked out uh, more comics. Uh, I am caught up on Superman now. Joshua Williamson is doing a fantastic job. Uh, I really like what they're doing with the whole uh, super core thing. Uh, Night Terrors is really good. Uh, the revival of, uh, well, spoiler alert for last month's issue of Night Terrors, but the revival of Wesley Dodd's Sandman was such a cool twist. And it's going to be so dope seeing Dead Man and Sandman team up to uh, take down Insomnia. Uh, a lot of the tie-in issues for um, Night Terrors have also been pretty solid. Been enjoying that. Uh a series uh, that I actually checked out for uh, research purposes. Uh, funny enough, it's you know tangentially connected to uh, the movie we're going to be talking about soon. Is uh, I found that Greg Rucka actually did in 2019 a 20 issue Lois Lane series called Lois Lane. Nice. Um, Enemy of the People, and mm. it's really good. It's like this globe trotting investigation where basically lois has to take down somebody who has a secret that could ruin clark's life and it, it's really really good it's got you know your classic rucka ingredients of intrigue espionage mystery just good shit uh like the series a lot um I also read the uh, miniseries by Tom King, Gotham City Year One, which uh, basically is a it's it's not like Batman Year One. It's literally a story about Gotham City itself and the different people in Gotham City. If I had to equate it to anything, it's kind of similar to the uh, Gotham Central series that was out a few years ago. <laughs> Very similar to that. Batman does show up, but he only shows up once uh, in the entire miniseries, and it's a cameo. Uh, really well done. Tom King does phenomenal on these, like, just uh, focused uh, miniseries. Uh, I also reread Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow. Phenomenal. I, I need this in a hardcover so that I can have a nice, solid edition to hold in my hands. But looking at the art digitally is still really dope uh highly recommend checking that one out um i'm also reading uh batman superman world's finest uh the new teen titans mark wade absolutely killing it mark wade's also killing it on shazam a whole wide variety i'm checking out a whole wide variety of books i've been really deep diving into dc uh williamson's green arrow different things like that but yeah i've been really getting into comics lately folks uh just you know di diving right back into it um i even i even checked out some marvel stuff um uh, i'm really looking forward to seeing what happens with the fall of x that's going on uh because like x-men has been on fire lately so really looking forward to that um but i think that is pretty much it on my list uh like like i mentioned before in comment corner i did see uh, TMNT Mutant Mayhem. If you want to hear my full thoughts, you could check out that solo video. Uh, Brian can put the card 
some a future bride and can put the card somewhere above my head or something uh but uh check out that video if you want to hear my full thoughts but that's pretty much it for my screen time so we're gonna go ahead and jump to trailer talk Trailer Talk is the segment where Brian has a carefully curated playlist of uh, trailers. Uh, this time we're shortening it down to three to cut down on time. And you guys can check out that playlist in the description down below. But Brian, tell the folks at home, what are the three trailers we will be reacting to tonight? Well, today we got a little bit of variety. I thought for first three... We do like one of each, a movie, a TV show, and then a internet thing. Okay. First of all, we've got trailer for the new Adam Sandler movie. Well, I say Adam Sandler. He's supporting cast. Uh, you are so not invited to my bat mitzvah. It stars his real-life daughters and... Is the drama about a girl who is trying to schedule her own bat mitzvah and then things start imploding in her teenage life because, you know, teenage drama and shit. Mm -hmm. Then we got a very interesting one coming from Apple TV called The Changeling. Ooh. It's a TV show based on the... Uh, Based on a book of the same name by author uh, Victor Lavalle, Victor Lavale. Hmm. I don't think I've heard of this. Uh, he also did a book called The Ballad of Black Tom. Oh, I've read The Ballad of Black Tom. It's the same author. Cool. Cool. Uh, and uh, basically, the story seems to be about um, a man goes in a search for his wife after she does something horrific in the aftermath of the birth of their first child. Mm. Oh. And it looks like it's set in a uh, like urban fantasy type world. Oh, cool. And the main man in question is kind of an underrated uh, actor of Hollywood currently, but still great every time we see him. Lakeith Stanfield. Is he really underrated? Mm -hmm. he's, in a, he's in a lot of stuff. I feel like I can't escape Lakeith Stanfield. But he's never, he's never the lead, though. He's been the lead in a couple of things. You just, I guess you don't watch enough black movies, Brian. <laughs> nope, but anytime I do see him, I love him. Yeah, no, he's great. He's great. You know, he's fantastic. Huh? And then, lastly, I know this is a little bit different, and I don't know how much you're going to take from it, Jay, but uh, they released a full trailer for uh, Chapter 2 of Candela Obscura. Okay. Cool. I know, I know you and t I know you and Tony are hyped about it. This will, you know, maybe give me an idea of, like, you know, what the shit's about, so I'm interested. All right, folks, well... We will return shortly with our rapid fire thoughts on these three trailers via the magic of editing. Until then, uh, here is a word from our non-existent sponsors. We shall return. And we're back. Uh, real quick before we jump into our thoughts on the trailers, uh, I forgot to mention that there is one other show that I checked out for screen time, and it is actually a Paramount Plus show that has been out for a few weeks now. I watched like the first five episodes. It's a weekly drop. Uh, it's a tra And we react to the trailer, I want to say. Uh, it's a Lioness Special Ops. Uh, oh, we did. The one with Zoe Saldana. I really like it so Whoa. far. Nice. It's done by the uh, Yellowstone guy. Yeah, yeah. It, it's really good. And uh, they say that it could start a uh, new uh, shared universe. Mm -hmm. It's got really, it's got really good action. Uh, very well acted. Um, I I like it. I don't know if it's like a podcast type show, but it's definitely a for, it's definitely a fun watch. Nice. Mm -hmm. 
All right, but back to the topic at hand. Let's talk trailers. So, um, the first one, the uh, the uh, you are so not invited to my bat mitzvah. That was a funny one to kind of like experience with the guys, cause like we watched it. And we all had the exact same thought when the trailer started. Like, oh my god, I feel old. Because, you know, usually with these, like, teen movies, they cast, like, Hollywood teens, which are actually, like, 20-somethings. But then they... But it really threw me off because they actually casted, you know, teenagers. And I was like, oh my god, these are babies. Look at, look at them. They're so... They're so young and tiny. What, 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 I feel so oh, old. Oh, yeah. Which, uh, the funny thing is, is I was telling you off camera, but, uh, uh, Heartstoppers also did that. Mm-hmm. Where, in season one, the actors are, like, 18, 19. Huh, nice. Uh, but what did you guys think about, uh, You Are So Not Invited to My Bat Mitzvah? Other than feeling old? Uh, yeah, I love it. Um, yeah, same. Yeah, like it. It looks fun. Like nothing like groundbreaking, but like I might check it out. Don't know. Yeah, it's definitely not like podcast worthy, but like maybe just a fun watch. Yeah, for real. Um, th- one that definitely is podcast worthy. That we're gonna. That you know. I'm so glad that I made the decision. I was like, all right, you know, everybody has contributed a streaming service to the podcast. I'm going to contribute Apple TV. And man, I picked the right time to do it because that Changeling trailer yeah. looks super interesting. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. if you guys are familiar with mythology, uh, the fair folk ain't nothing to fuck with. And, um, nope. man, this looks intense. I'm really interested. I wonder if it's a mini series. They didn't really say in the trailer. Uh, very curious. I've heard nothing uh, but good things about like a lot of the stuff on Apple TV. I love Ted Lasso. Um, uh, and yep. I, I really want to watch that. The quiet room show with Tom Holland. Yeah. And, uh, that one show with Chris uh, Evans one? Ron Weasley. Oh yeah, the Ron Weasley one. The Chris Evans show. I also heard really good things about. That one's a movie. But it's a yeah. movie. Oh, it's a movie. Gotcha. Also, uh, to semi maybe answer your question, uh, the name of the trailer for the Changeling was the Changeling season one trailer. Oh okay, mm. cool. So so it is not a miniseries. Nice. If it does well. Cool. Because Apple also has been known to uh, uh, their last original show. They canceled it like five episodes in. By the way, speaking of Apple original shows, just a, just a side tangent that's still related. Uh, did they ever make a season two of Dickinson? We really, I remember we yeah. both really enjoyed the first the first season. Uh, I believe like Ted Lasso, it went for three seasons. Oh wow. Man, I got, yeah, no, I'm definitely benching that when I when I uh, get Apple TV for the for, for the pod. Shit, uh, but yeah, um, so this the last one, Candela Obscura. Uh, I don't really have much to say about it because I'm not invested as they got guys. So I'll let these two take over for that. And since you said Brian that their each individual playthrough is uh. A self-contained story other than like lore bits you can just watch this particular chapter for just on its own right oh cool i didn't know yeah because well uh what they're doing with candela obscura is uh is uh they've got different chapters and each chapter is like a series of uh basically one shots where they're Ah. Are like one or two themes that transfer over, but you can watch any episode of Candela Obscura and not need backstory like with Critical Role. Okay, mm. cool. Interesting. It's just the different chapters represent the different like uh, groups of players. Um, like this, uh, this next one 
has uh, Marcia Ray, Travis Willingham, uh, Luis, I'm forgetting his last name. He was on their, uh, their uh, Calamity, like Mini. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they also got a uh, girl from... Um, that's also uh, doing the Stray Gods with some of them. Mm. And also one thing about Kendall Obscura is uh, Matt did the uh, did the GMing for the chapter one, like them first getting into it. But they're uh, they're going to be like uh, switching around uh, GMs for the different chapters. Yeah, I remember for, you mentioning uh, that chapter two, uh, Brandon Lee Mulligan is going to GM. That's cool. Nope. Oh, he's no, he's playing. playing. He's playing. You're right. Yeah. Uh, the GM for for uh, chapter two is actually uh, one of their dudes that mainly works behind the scenes who is a co-creator of the game. Oh, cool. So he better understands the game than even Mercer. Nice. And uh, when it comes to like a new different uh, system, it's best to have the creative hand that knows it like the back of their hand. Then someone who has like a cursory understanding. Yeah, it makes sense. Thanks for well, helping yeah, it... with mm -hmm. my brain pop. No worries. It looks um it looks interesting. Like the first one was just like uh like the people of the city, like after the war happened and just like the your average citizens. Here it looks like they might actually go into the war. And uh, oddly enough, Jay, uh -huh. also expand on, like, uh, the horror fairy type stuff. Oh, cool. I'm glad but, you... like, uh, not, like, D&D &D fairy, but, like, horror fairy. Yeah, I'm glad you enunciated, because that could have clear... That could have easily come across as horror fairy. Uh, but, yeah... Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. I definitely want to... Uh, then I might have to check out the second chapter. Oh, also, um, this um, second chapter comes out, I think, August 28th. It's streaming on YouTube and Twitch. And then it'll be uh, two weeks later, they're going to release the VOD. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um... Also, uh, I know this sounds like a plug, but, but it's not just, spawned. no, it's not, not yet. Um, but, uh, also, uh, if you have a Cinemark theater in your area, you can actually go to see the first episode of chapter two in the theater. Oh, cool. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Critical Role has actually had a, uh, ongoing, um, relationship with Cinemark Theaters like uh oh, that's awesome the yeah. first episode the first episode of uh campaign three mm -hmm. was aired in theaters oh that's cool nice so now without further ado let's get to the main event let us talk about one heart of stone now Careful, agents, we are heading into classified territory, so if you do not have the proper clearance, please evacuate immediately. I am going to count you out before I allow you to exit. Five, the four, heart will not protect you. three, two, one. Let's go. Let's go ahead and start talking about it. Wow, this movie was good i, oh, I, I really enjoyed it like from the cold like i love that it had a cold open james bond style oh yeah like a whole well, ass like adventure action scene before even the it, credits yeah and it, it was weird because it was like a james bond scene but not like the the uh like yeah, the, the action in the field, it was the people in the van. Yeah, I, yeah that was a unique perspective. I liked and, that that's what we followed for the most part. 
Mm-hmm. And James yep. Bond is all about, hi, even though I'm a secret agent, I'm very, like, out there. Yeah. And mm-hmm. No, she was like, shit, shit, shit. I need to stay quiet. I need to stay in. They can't find out about me. Yeah, no, but she, I need to save their asses. She was, uh, yeah, she was very clever. Um, yeah. Uh, and I think that's one of the favorite things I like about this fun cold open. It's, uh, that juxtaposition from your typical spy flick, right? Mm-hmm. Where you have someone who's typically like the intel individual that stays stationary. Yeah, you're cute. That you're out of harm's way. And she fits in that role for the MI6 crew through a good portion of the movie, only to then just like Turn go on, on that switch. Like, yep, just turn on the badass mode. Uh, which, like, uh, by the way, just to, to compliment Gal here, like, yeah, I feel like this is definitely like her strong suit. Um, so to to go back to DC a little bit, one of my like kind of one of my criticisms for uh, Gal's performances, or at least how DC uses Wonder Woman, uh, in the uh, like at least in the previous outings, is. Uh, they try too hard to go for this, like, fun, lighthearted thing with her. And it it's not her kind of humor, so it comes off forced and awkward. With Heart of Stone, it's much more of, like, a dry wit kind of thing. And it, like, very much complements her, like, stoic badass, like, character. But she still has, like, again, just that dry wit and charm, which I think works much better than trying to force her to be lighthearted. Also, she nailed that awkwardness, but also we knew that that was a uh, An act, mask. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's very much a, like, by-the-numbers movie. You know, like, you pretty much know where everything is going, but it's a fun ride to be on, regardless. I think the concept of the heart is really fucking interesting. Oh, yeah. Indeed. Um, I will say that, uh, I kind of didn't, I should have seen it in hindsight, but I kind of didn't see the whole... The Parker thing? Uh, Miss... Mr. Gray being evil. Yeah, same. I didn't. I didn't expect. The, yeah, the Parker twist caught me off guard too. I was so upset. I wanted Yang to live. I liked Yang, yo. I liked both of them. Yeah, same. And I felt so bad for Barry. Poor Barry the cat. Yeah, and, and also, uh, Barry. Mm-hmm. The cat is a, just a, reminds me of a nice chubber, good cat. And as a fellow cat person, I mean, person who owns a cat, <laughs> I get taking care of that fur child. And poor uh, Bailey, man. Yeah, Shh. man. Yeah, I, I love that line, though, when uh, she's, like, revealed herself. And he's like, so I guess it's proper to say that you're fit for the field. Yep. Oh man, yeah, no, like this. This had good humor in it, but it didn't feel like MCU humor, where no. like, thank God, we're like, because like the the problem I've had with uh, and you know, I'm gonna keep comparing it to superhero stuff because she's you know very entrenched in the like superhero genre, like also Rudka, yeah, and Rud and Rucka, yeah, but like. Mm-hmm. The humor doesn't feel like MCU humor where, like, it undercuts the seriousness. It was just a nice little breath of levity. And like I said, uh, she isn't forced to be funny. All all the parts where she makes jokes, they're very dry, almost deadpan. And I, I, I th- it works much better for her. Yeah, and a good chunk of the other humor is just from the people around her. Mm-hmm. Like the, uh, what was it? Uh, the uh, Six of Hearts person. Yep. That like helped her 
on the beach. Yeah, and I, I yeah. love and I loved uh I love it when uh she's at the base and then Nomad's like, wait, is she developing a sense of humor? <laughs> like and yeah. yeah. That was that was what that was really fun. And mm -hmm. other things back to like cult, like the twists and turns of this particular like spy story. I like a lot of the different motivations. Except for one. For, for yeah. our two full antagonists. Yeah. I so, think it... so uh, me and Brian actually had this conversation in text off camera, and I brought it mm -hmm. up to him, and I'm like, you know, this is basically the plot to Falcon and Winter Soldier, but done better. Yeah, in a way. Because, like, if you look at Kea and you look at, like, Carly from Falcon and Winter Soldier, very similar yeah. motivations, yeah. but, we like... Cast Peter. Yeah, like, very similar motivations, but, like, with, with, Kea, with Kea, like, they actually do a bet. they actually do a better job of making her sympathetic and be, and, you know, she realizes, oh, shit, I fucked up. Let me, let me try and fix this. But also, she's like, well, let me face the consequences of my actions. I did this shit, so I'll go to jail. Well, with um, making the analogy of Heart of Stone, mm -hmm. with Falcon and Winter Soldier, they tried to make her both. That's what I'm saying. Kaya yeah, and Parker. Yeah, they, try, they tried to... I've never liked this phrase because it never made any sense to me, but they tried to have their cake and eat it too, you know? Yeah. Like... You, you can't have both in that situation. Like, I think Parker and Kaya worked really well as separate characters to contrast, like, because, you know, there's still hope for Kaya because she's still young and she still has that idealism and that sense of justice, whereas Parker is jaded and he's just kind of bitter and resentful at the world because he feels like he's just a tool he's been used and you know no one yeah, actually and, cares about him yeah and that and learning more about his backstory and all that stuff interest he's a fun fun in a very stretched sense of the word no, in I, terms of like a great antagonist mm -hmm. but i just didn't vibe with his like villain motivation so here's how i see it and i think it's especially because um this is a screenplay written by greg rucka parker mm -hmm. is what bucky would be if bucky didn't have steve i can see that and one of the things that i kind of point to what it, it's probably me trying to figure out his whole motivation because he doesn't really say what he's trying to do. I mean, it's, fully? I, 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 so from what I understand from like me piecing it together, he is trying to basically take out all the intelligence or organizations who have been like misusing their people and just kind of using people as disposable well, weapons. Yeah, I think that's what I understood too, but then again, I go back to like this initial thought. When he tried to do his best to, like he said it himself, he wanted to change because people in power who just want to do, to keep the status quo and not really change anything. Yeah. And it got me thinking like, well, if you wanted to be that focus of change, that would mean you would have to just do things for your own benefit. Yeah, you and, know? I, and I mean, like, I, I think the yeah. point with his character is the whole, you know, the old adage of absolute power corrupts absolutely, you know? Yeah, because my, my thing for him is uh, the way that I saw it was that Initially, he started this journey just as revenge. He wanted to to kill the kings for yeah. killing and, his and men, then, and then reform and then reform the charter from the inside. You know, basically build it the way he but, wanted it. 
But along the way, he realized all the power at his hands and... Yeah, it got, it got to his head. Yeah. yeah. And Rachel did point out that... <clears throat> pointed out very well when she basically had their last confrontation. Mm -hmm. That she basically called him out like, Hey, you may... You're just going to use this for yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I think that basic motivation works, and I like that. It's very simple motivation. But his road to getting to that, like, hey, if I use the heart, is a tad... I mean, uh, it, for a spy movie, it works, but... No, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, like, yeah. I like... Elaborate, secu uh, elaborate security schemes are kind of just, you know, what comes with the territory with spy movies, though. So, like, you know, <laughs> it is dumb when you actually, like, look at it, but you're not supposed to look at it. But for what we were given, I was actually surprised at how well the oh, yeah, game was, is yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. did it, because uh, usually, usually his, like, bread and butter is uh is uh kind of uh bad guys that you want to redeem he didn't and uh one thing that i did enjoy is that he was evil but he didn't ham it up he wasn't like cartoonish evil and also there was no redeeming for him yeah exactly but but also there was still that bit there was still that charisma to him that i also just really enjoyed yeah because I know he's most known for being Mr. Gray, but in my head, he was first, and most will be for me, the Huntsman. Oh yeah, from in Once Upon, Upon a Time. Time. Yep. Where you thought he was the bad guy until he romanced the the main lead, and then spoiler alert. The evil queen killed him for turning sides. Also, that like there's a lot of like really really dark sus implications with Once Upon a Time, but that's a whole other video. Oh, oh yeah, oh. mega sus. Uh, but yeah, I I know I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, once again, the action scenes phenomenal. That whole shit with the the, the like squirrel suit, squirrel a uh, flying squirrel yeah. suit oh. sequence. Holy shit. Oh, yeah. That, that was that was some put that that, one scene from uh, Black Widow to shame. Yeah, that was like some Tom oh, Cruise yeah. Mission Impossible yeah. type shit. Yeah, and uh, use use the other girl's um, parachute for herself at the end because mm -hmm. she was no longer squirrel suited. Yep, and uh, like I uh, one thing that I also really appreciate just as someone who enjoys action films like. This was an action film who, which scenes didn't like feature a bunch of like jump cuts and shit. Like you actually really got to see the action, because like that's the thing with like modern action movies, especially when you feature like the clearly getting up there in their years action stars like your Liam Neesons. They're like a bajillion yeah. cuts because you know they want Liam Neeson to do cool things, but Liam Neeson's knees will not let him do cool things. Which, uh, that's one thing that I forgot to mention with, uh, jujitsu is, uh, they did a little bit of that, and they also did, like, weird camera work. Like, at one point, there was first-person stuff, but it would transition from third-person to first-person. Interesting. But, yeah, no, the, but the it, cinematography for the, the fights... The action in this one, though. Yeah, the cinematography for the fights was, uh, phenomenal. Um, like, I, I, really I hadn't, uh... Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say I hadn't seen the uh, the uh, car chase in the latest Mission Impossible yet, mm -hmm. but uh, I did really like the car chase in this one where they were in that uh, beat up uh, van. Oh, in the desert? Yeah, that shit was cool. Well, no, I was talking about uh, before. Oh, before, Parker turned on. Them. Oh, right, 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 right before Yang and Bailey died. Yeah, that was cool. That was cool. Yeah. I, I enjoyed that one. Um. And I know, like, the, like, invincible henchman trope in spy movies is a thing. Mm -hmm. 
in terms of those kinds of henchmen, Blondie fucking sucks. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, he was weak sauce. He was weak sauce. I believe his um name was just simply the blonde. Yeah, he, he like he he, he he got like a handful of lines. He was annoying. I did not like that guy. Uh, I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but visually, he kind of reminded me a little bit of XQC. Huh. Yeah. I can. You know what? I can see it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah over, overall, man, I just like, I just, I thought this movie was really well done. You know, I was, I was a little worried about this movie going into it. If I'm, if I'm being honest, cause I watched Red Notice Yeah. and Red yeah. Notice was not so good. So I was a little apprehensive about this movie going into it, but it definitely surprised me. Oh yeah, indeed. Um, which we'll call it. Uh, I will admit that there were some flaws, like we've mentioned before. Also, the fact that twice there was just the uh, big action scene going on, and uh, we cut to the quote unquote like people in the van, and they're just watching her, or they're uh, just. Uh, being fridged basically yeah pretty much uh but yeah um this, also uh, uh-huh. also the boss is talking about how you're not supposed to have attachments yet she has a very clear attachment i mean do, uh, if, we, if we've learned anything from star wars anybody who says yep i was just about to bring that up yeah so you know that's a given. Uh, so uh, the thing, the thing that Brian mentioned before that I, you know, I think is really interesting is that like this world leaves itself so open that like I would actually want to see a sequel to this. Uh, unlike <clears throat> last week with they clone Tyrone, I totally want a sequel to this. Mm-hmm. Um, like oh yeah, I, and especially because they established that the, the new team with uh you know with Stone and Joker and Jack, I want to see them in action. Oh yeah, and the things that they could get up to, and Look. also I want to see the new kings. Yeah, R. I. P. B. D. Wong, man. Which yeah. uh, Thank I don't you. know about y'all, mm. but uh. It seemed to me like he knew that that was a trap. Oh, side note, no, Bigger. she, she. If you had the, if you have the, uh, if you have these, uh, capture, if you had the subtitles on, uh, they refer to uh, King of Clubs as she. Hmm. Well, yeah. So Are you sure you're not talking about Glenn Close? No, no, they weren't. No, it wasn't. It was when it was when BD Wong was. It was when BD Wong was murdered, not when Glenn Close was murdered. I know Glenn Close. Be- I think that was his name. Yeah. That was his name. Oh, his name was she. Oh, because the because the because the cause the, yeah. cause the, the, the caption the, the the subtitle said S H E instead of like S H I. Okay, interesting. That was, must be a like a little a little sub error there, huh? Yeah. But B D Wong was either way. B D Wong was awesome for the little bit that. He was in there. Yeah, and yeah, I feel I, like... yeah. And then, like you mentioned before, I was not expecting Glenn Close. Like, what the? Fu- I'm like, whoa, what? Glenn Close is in this? Yeah. And uh, with the BD Wong, it was kind of cool how they gave him his own little sub plot there. Yeah, yeah, because he was but... the one that you know, like gave the order to you know kill all the Parker's people. Which. Like I said, I feel like he knew that it was a trap, but also kind of shame on you if you did and still brought in the men. Yeah, like, uh, no, because that's how I felt, because I'm like, I get what you're doing. This is like you atoning for it because like, you know, you it was your mistake, but your guys didn't do any of that. What the fuck? Yeah, that was my exact thought. Because he even, uh, he yeah, even says that the, uh, I hear you. Gene, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, she can come in later. We're going to go in anyway. Mm-hmm. He knew that was a trap, yet still he brought his men. Yeah, that was fucked up. That was fucked up. I'm not yeah. going to lie. Yeah, and also, let's... I'll give this to Parker. 
he officially wanted to get rid of somebody. <laughs> he sure did. Oh, yeah. But he really went for the family, too, man. Yeah. That was that was that was unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Um, and all the innocents that died in the uh, mm-hmm. the uh, elevator. I really, scene. Mm-hmm. I really just want, I really want to see like just kind of the aftermath of all this though. Like, like what's this? Oh, yeah. What's this world like now that like this all this shit has been shaken up? The entire infrastructure of the charter has been like rocked. Also. Uh... If they are rebuilding, what does it look like for the life of the uh, the agents of like a uh, diamond and uh, club? Yeah, and yeah, exactly. Man. We might get like rogue agents in like the sequel. Yeah. Also, it does look like from uh, from that scene that I mentioned before of her. In the middle of nowhere, going upon shore, that your suit doesn't exactly indicate where you are. Yep. Yeah, so I, it's definitely interesting. Uh, like, I I, I want to see more for sure. Uh, like, I I think this this was definitely a hit. Uh, in my opinion. Oh yeah. It's a it's a really oh, yeah. it's, a, it's a really fun action movie for like hundred percent. Like perfect. I feel like they could also do like stuff in this world that doesn't have a gal in it. Yeah, like, I, like you know how you described. I mean, you mentioned it in text, but like you know how you described Citadel, how like it's you know a yeah. movie that's supposed to spin off into a TV show where it just talk, uh, like is more in the world and stuff. I want to see that with this. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, indeed. Because the thing with Citadel, this thing with Citadel was it was. An interesting world, but the story within the world was not that good. Mm. With this one, the the story and the world were both good, which I hate to say it, but I feel like maybe Citadel might have done better if it was just a movie. Yeah. Um, I mean, I- we would always have moments of like, some TV shows deserve to be movies, and some movies deserve to be TV shows. And is uh, that weird? Yeah. Uh, movie, right. And I and I think that like Heart of Stone really took advantage of being a movie. It was paced really well. Like I was on the edge of my seat the entire time. Nothing felt oh, like yeah. it, nothing felt like it overstayed its welcome. Like uh, there was actually legit like a moment where I thought, okay, we're building up to the finale, and. She's going to fly in, and this is going to be the finale. And then I look down at the time, and it's like, there's still 30 minutes left? Same! I, I, did, that, I did that exact same shit. Uh, that, but that's it wasn't actually... in a bad way? Oh, yeah. Like, honestly, like, I, the only reason I didn't watch it in one sitting was because I got hungry. And I was like, you know what? I'm going I'm to take a break. I'm going to eat and come back. That was me Cause... at like, the 50-minute mark of, like, in the middle of the movie. Yep. Because some movies would have ended with you just uh, with them uh, walking in the sunset in, on the on the desert and just end it there. Yep. But yeah, so I mean, I feel like we covered pretty much any, everything. So, um... oh, by the way, mm-hmm. let's not forget uh, the one characterization that uh, Bailey had. He was trying to look for something. For his niece for her birthday. No, no, it's for his daughter. It's for his daughter. It was his niece. Oh, it was his niece? Oh, okay. Yeah, with the, with the dollhouse. I thought that mm-hmm. was cute. Yep. And also, justice for Barry. Yep. He got to... Yep, he found, yep. He found, he found a new home. I, I love that moment. She, she, she sees her in the window. She's like, hi, Barry. I'm just like, oh. Yeah, because oh, Barry got to live with his sister and his uh, niece. Yep. Yep. And also, one of my favorite scenes in this movie, gotta say it, is when she goes into Bailey's house. And... Yeah, and she she looks at the photos and oh, stuff. Yeah. yeah, that was a really, uh, that was a like also, a, a really good use of like just silence and facial acting on a uh, gal's part. Yeah, Barry's just like, 
bit apprehensive, like typical cat behavior, and then after a while, he's, he's purring. And and and, and, it, and it was a nice like callback because like in the in the beginning when he talks about like, when Bailey was talking about his bury the cat story, she is like you know, uh, you know before long you'll want one of your own. She's like you know, and she says, "Nah, cats hate me." I I thought that was a nice like little full circle moment. It it was also, I don't know if it was just me. I know I texted this to you, Jay. Mm-hmm. But I felt vibes of like flirtation in that scene from Bailey. Oh yeah, from Bailey and uh, towards Rachel. Yeah. I mean, well, to be fair, not just they... Bailey and Rachel, but I was talking about also. Uh, what was her name? Naya. Yay. Oh, Kaya. No. Oh, Kaya. 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 Uh, Kaya and Rachel. I, feel I mean, like Ka- there was Kaya, a little Ka- bit of flirtation. I don't know. Kaya is way too young for Rachel. Yeah, Kaya is twenty-two. Kaya, Kaya is way too young for Rachel. That's a... I, I feel like that now, but the way that they were going back and forth in the beginning. No, the way I kind of saw it, Brian, was that uh, Rachel saw a lot of herself in Kaya. Yeah, I. So I, she's trying. I, yeah, I, I can. I can see that now. I, I can see that I, now. I, but... I got more of a. I got more of a big sister. Little like. Like the the annoying kid sister that wants to tag along and impress their older sibling kind of thing, that's what I got. Yeah, uh, yeah, I get that now. I oh, guess I've it. just been consuming too much stuff like uh, Killing Eve and all of that. Have you been watching oh Killing God. Eve? Killing Eve is amazing. Have you seen Killing Eve? Well, I just meant like that fact where it's just like. You know that type of relationship is common now in media. Well, yeah, because well, because Killing Eve was liter- literally like the uh, like the guy, the person who created the show was like, "All right, so what if I made a show where it was Batman and a Joker, but it was two women, and I actually used that sexual tension that everybody feels with oh, Batman yeah. and the Joker." But anyway, I'm cool to see like where they go from here. Mm-hmm. For sure. If uh, she can get like a new, like good Parker, yeah, to work in the field with her. Yeah, but you know, I would prefer. I I, I like her just be. I like her just being in the lead role, like like as the boss. I think that's fun. We honestly don't need another yeah. member to the team. Yeah, we don't need someone to play her second banana. You know. Yeah. I I feel it. Here's here's one of the things that I was happy that didn't happen. Okay. Right? That uh you know how typically in mostly Bond movies you mm-hmm. have the Bond pro, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There there was no there was there was no there was no Bond guy in this for her. Like I yeah. in the beginning of I, it, I, I thought Parker was gonna be the Bond guy. Yeah. I did too. That's what I thought, and then I was wrong that he was the yeah. like yeah he was the villain what? they the, you know what i said when i when he uh when he killed uh ba- when he killed bailey and yang this is gonna sound really stupid but i said this out loud and i laughed at myself for saying it but uh when he shot them i was like oh, they pulled the hans <laughs> <laughs> if you remember hans from frozen i was like this is just hans yeah. but with murder <laughs> And, fish each other's sandwiches. And here's the stupid thing about that thought, right? Uh-huh. My initial thought was like, well, what the fuck, Park? Yep. You out here trying to look hot as shit. Yep. Then again, you just be acting like dumb as fuck. Yep. Which the funny thing is, is uh, good on Jimmy Durham, though, because uh, he had the British accent. When he was the MI6. Yep. Yeah. But then when he shot them, he revealed his real accent, which is his actual accent. Yeah, I, li- I, li- I like that touch. Mm. Also, um, just a just a small side note, I really love how the music was used uh, in oh, in yeah. this um, in this movie. The score and soundtrack were like fantastic. I wish we had one of those like Bond. Eskimo, because you know how like every Bond movie has the big, like in the cold open has their big theme song, like moment. Oh, yeah. I wish mm-hmm. we had one of those. Like if they, if we had that in the cold open, that cold open would have been perfect. Because like 
still to this day one of my favorite modern bond cold opens is skyfall just because of how that song is used oh my god man let the sky fall i don't like it for not going too deep into that you know oh yeah no no i i appreciate it for doing its own thing but uh, you know as someone who loves the genre i i kind of wanted to see that still a little bit yeah and I think you got a little bit of that in the song that they chose for the credits. Oh yeah, like the opening credits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they didn't like they didn't like bring in someone like say John Legend to come in and sing part of Stone oh, song. Oh man! Although, favorite scene, although... another favorite scene. Uh huh. Movie. I gotta say this because it's really stupid for me. Uh huh. Because I actually do like this song. Oh, <laughs> oh, the, oh, the little song? No, no, the trucker. Oh, yeah. Trucker and... Oh, God. ...into a fucking foreigner. I want to know what love is. Yep. The what? trucker. Yeah. Would you like me to wait? No, definitely not. Okay. Uh... No, when he... <laughs> when Rachel's, like, hanging off the side of his truck... Sorry. And he's like, what the fuck? Sorry, I need to borrow your truck. Um, all right. I do like the genuine nicety of him where he's like, do you want me to wait? Yeah. Listen, if, if you see a pretty lady hanging off the side of your truck, you're, you're going to want to make sure that lady's okay. I respect the man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're smart, smart, uh, smart northern man. <laughs> All right, so yeah. now okay. let's go ahead and jump into final thoughts and ratings. Uh, we'll start with you, Brian. Okay. Yeah, I really like this. Um, like we said here, there there were little small bits here and there that kind of irked, and like we said, overall, it is a... Uh, it is very, like predictable where you know where it's going to go somewhat uh minus that one scene with parker mm -hmm. but so it's not a perfect movie but it's a spy action movie it's not supposed to be so it's kind of weird to give it a rating yeah I mean, personally, yeah. I'm rating it as like as a as a summer blockbuster action flick. Personally, that's a, that, that's my metric that I'm going by in my head to determine my score. Yeah, that's kind of the same headspace that I'm going to be giving it. Uh, so yeah, as just. Because I went in rating it as a movie overall. Mm -hmm. as, as a movie overall, I'd probably give it a, uh, what? Shit. I'd say 7.5 out of 10. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so I'll go. I'll go ahead and go next. So I, I guess since you did it, I'll I'll separate my ratings into two. If we're talking like just kind of as an overall movie, I'd probably give this a solid seven, seven out of ten. But if I'm judging it by the metrics of your like summer action blockbuster, like turn your brain off and have fun, spy thriller type movie, I'd give it an eight. Like, depends on what you're looking for. But, like, it's about in that range, personally. <laughs> Either way, tradition continues. Yeah. So, Tony, what about you? Final thoughts and ratings. Well, as a fun action uh, spy movie, definitely needed it after a few, like, in real life moments that I've been trying to deal with, and Needed I think this something. was a, I think this was a good palate cleanser, at least for me. After uh, they cloned Tyrone, like something that where I had to like think really deeply about it, as opposed to something mm -hmm. where I could just oh, yeah. watch for fun. Yeah, oh, yeah. And uh, I think with that, I'm, 
I'll just be in the same boat as you, Jay, with seven and eight for oh. the two respective scores. Okay, cool. I mean, my different for this, the differences for my seven is that uh, the main villain's overall motivations is a bit napped yeah. a little. No, I can understand but, that. Yeah, that's, that's I thought part of, of the reason why 7.5 for me. Yeah, same. Is, that, that, that's the reason for my 7 as well. Funny how that works, right? Mm -hmm. But still, fun overall movie. Oh, yeah, for sure. So it's... Uh, oh, oh, yeah. I've missed Spy Thriller. Same. Same. I'm, yeah. I'm, gl I'm glad that they're uh, starting to come back. Uh, but yeah. Once the strike is over, can we bring back Bond with a new actor? Right? Please? Uh, but yeah, so that wraps up our Heart of Stone uh, movie review. So, Brian, what movie are we covering next week? Go ahead and let the folks at home know. Well, we're going a little bit different, but still staying in the thing of network Netflix originals. We are going with... The Monkey King. That's right, folks. Mm -hmm. You thought we were done with Journey to the West? You thought wrong. We're going we're back going in, back. baby. I'm excited. We reacted to this trailer. It looked like it was a lot of fun. So I'm definitely hyped. Check this yep. one out. I think this will be a blast. Hopefully you enjoyed this uh, easy breezy episode of the Channel Tasters podcast. And uh, thank you again for everybody who tuned in. And uh, thank you to everybody who listened a day early on Spotify and everybody who watched over here on YouTube.com forward slash Channel Teachers Podcast. Uh, be sure to leave this video a like, do all the usual YouTube things, comment and subscribe, and stay tuned to the channel because we will have more content like solo reviews, Brian's shorts, and updates for our top secret project. Keep an eye out for that one, folks. But until then... We'll catch you guys later. Peace.